Hi, today I'm going to talk about linear viscoelasticity. I'm going to derive the theory of linear viscoelasticity from first principle for a 1D case. And I'm going to build upon that in a series of videos to talk about linear viscoelasticity, how it works, how you should use it, and how you should think about it. And um, the, the starting point here is really about uh, how you can combine elasticity and viscosity or viscoelasticity together into a good material model. And this is a really old theory, but it's really nice because the theory is it fits together very nicely and it's kind of interesting to present it that way. So my goal here is to talk about this in as easy way as possible to present the key theories and then you can kind of better understand why this works and why it doesn't work in many cases. It all starts with Boltzmann's superposition principle that says that each loading state is independent of the other ones and they all contribute to the final stress in the material. So let's take a look at this. So we'll do a thought experiment here. We'll, we'll do a jump in strain. This is 1D. So we jump the strain instantaneously to a certain value and then we hold that strain for a while. A real material uh, in our thought experiment will jump instantaneous to a some stress level and then it will start relaxing. Most polymers uh, will have some kind of viscous relaxation occurring and if you measure this relaxation you will measure stress as a function of time and if you divide it by the, the strain that you jump to you get the relaxation modulus ER of t. The key here that I will show today is that if you know the relaxation modulus as a function of time you really have everything you need to calculate the stress for any strain history. That's kind of cool. So clearly that's true though, if we just do a jump in strain, because that's what we did here. Let's do something a little bit more interesting. Well, most of the time we don't just jump a strain and we hold it. We, we have some kind of arbitrary strain history. So here is an equation that shows you how you can do this. The red line here is a number of little jumps in strain and hold periods. Uh, so that's a mathematical description of that equation. And if you make these jumps smaller and smaller and closer and closer together, you will get a continuous curve of some strain history. So mathematically, you can describe a strain, any strain history that you're interested in, in this form. So this is a summation of all of these little jumps by the jump magnitude. And this is a step function at t minus tau. So that's how this is. Just a way to describe strain as a function of time. And you can kind of see why we're doing this, because we want to be able to say that these are independent, these jumps, based on the Boltzmann's idea. So this is the equation from the previous page. It says, in general, we can describe a strain as a, as a summation of an infinite number of little jumps, like this. And now let's go to Boltzmann. Boltzmann said that these are independent, and we can sum the contribution from all of them in this way. So we sum from each uh, jump in strain and we know the stress from each jump is given by the relaxation modulus. So we directly can go from strain to stress in this form here. So this is what one can do and this is mathematically true. To make this more useful in real life, we convert the summation into an integral. So we sum, uh, convert a, uh, the sum to an integral and you may remember from your math classes back in the day that this is something you can do when this goes to infinity. So this is a, a integral that's exactly like this. Instead of delta epsilon, we do d epsilon. This is the relaxation modulus. We can also convert the, so the infinity here to the t variable by saying that there is no relaxation at negative times. So this is a really useful equation that tells you stress as a function of an integral of this kind. Uh, in most life, here's the same equation. And most times we don't want to integrate over d epsilon. So I'm going to do one more step here. I'm going to convert this by dividing it by dt and multiplying it by dt. And that gives me a summation, uh, an integral like this. So it's integral from 0 to t of this relaxation modulus that we measure times the strain rate. And we integrate that in this fashion. This is the master equation that we now derived from scratch that tells us we have any arbitrary strain history, we can calculate the strain rate, and if we know the stress relaxation modulus, this will give us the stress. Pretty interesting. So let's try it out. In my first example, I'm going to just do a stress relaxation experiment. We'll do a jump in strain, as shown here. And this is the equation from my previous page. 
And to be able to calculate this, we need some equation for the relaxation modulus itself. I'm going to assume that this relaxation modulus here is exponential in this fashion. So the relaxation modulus dec decays from this initial value uh, with this equation here. So we'll talk more about this and what this, how this is related to a Prony series later on. But if we put these together, I can insert this equation into this integral. And the beauty is that the integral of an exponential function is also an exponential function. So you can very quickly see that, um, if you do the math, that the stress as a function of time in this case becomes this. It's an exponentially decaying function uh, of, of this kind. And I plotted it down here. Depending on what tau series, you get different uh, rates of relaxation. So this is very simple. It goes back to the definition of the relaxation modulus. So just to show that this is easy and simple to do. In my second example, I'm going to take the master equation we have, and I'm going to consider a case of the monotonic tension. It continuously increased the strain. And uh, we have our master equation here. We are going to assume the same relaxation modulus in this case. I'm going to say that the strain is equal to a constant strain rate times time. I can then the, plug this into our master equation and do a little bit of math. It's very simple. Uh, half a page on a piece of paper, and you can end up with this equation. This is how the stress depends on the applied strain for a linear viscoelastic material model with this type of relaxation function. And if you look at this equation a little bit, I plotted it at the bottom, you can see that as the strain goes to infinity, this thing goes away and you get a steady state stress. Here it is, given by this number. Pretty weird. Is that what you expect for a polymer? Uh, usually it's not what you expect. It depends on the sub, uh, microstructure of the material. You can also see if you take the derivative of stress with respect to strain, that the, the, a lot of things cancel out and you get E0 back. So that initial slope here is E0 and the final value is given by this. Kind of interesting perhaps, but that's something that comes right out of these uh, equations. My third and last example today is about how about any strain history? What if we have some more complicated load and load situation? So in that case, you can't often do it in closed form. You need to solve it on a computer. But here is a, the master equation and, and some a little bit of code in a mathematical language called Julia. I really like Julia as a language. It's free, it's fast, it's cool. You should check it out. And here is a, a implementation a number of commands in Julia that solves this equation. And uh, this implementation, I should say, that's shown here is among the, the worst you can do. It's super slow and not efficient, and it, it's kind of all kinds of weirdness to it. But it works. It's correct. And the reason why I'm doing this is uh, this way is because that's how you would code up this equation. In real life, and I will show that in a later video, you would do it a little differently. You would solve this equation in a smarter way. But if you just brute force this equation, it's easy to do, and you get the right answer. So here is the function here. It's a, this is the strain. In this case, I loaded it up to 10% strain, and then I unloaded it. So that's just a mathematical uh, implementation here of that load unload. Then here's a function that gives me the strain rate. So I just do a numerical implementation of that. Of course, we need the strain rate here. And then the integrand is calculates this value, this uh, quantity here that we need to integrate over. So here's our integrand. It's just relaxation modulus times the strain rate. And down here is where we do the actual numerical integration. And the, the, the function in Julia that does that is quad gk. I integrate the integrand from 0 to t with a certain relative tolerance that I wanted to achieve. And uh, that's it. And I just plot the results. So it's a pretty short easy brute force simulation. And here it goes. Here's the results, stress versus strain. I can, of course, compare this to M calibration, which is what I typically use for these things. Uh, in M calibration, you can imp implement this example very easily. You have just set uh, a linear elastic plus a prony series with one term. And these are the values that I put in. And you get pretty much the same answer. So that shows how you can solve something like this in a pretty quick and dirty way on how you can do it in M calibration. So to summarize, uh, linear viscoelasticity, the theory is really cool. I will talk about that more and more in other videos. It's simple, and you get some cool equations very quickly. But there are a lot of things I left out, and I will cover this later on. Like, What, what about multi-axial loading? Uh, what is the Prony series anyway? And 
and some of these other things I mentioned down here. So I hope you found this a basic introduction in my first part of this series useful. I will cover some of these other topics in later videos. And if you have any questions for now, you can ask them below.